Oh, I'm going to tell you that from an from a student end, I know that all of this is a little nerve wracking. From an instructor end, I wake up in the middle of the night and I think, am I going to be able to make technology work today? What if it doesn't? What if Zoom goes down? Apparently it went down a lot on Monday, not for me, but um, for other people. And by the way, this is Cosimel behind me, the trip that I took when I didn't go to Europe a few years ago. Um, now that I'm older, I get to travel. I never could travel very much. Um, well, pretty much at all. So anyways, here we go. Um, one thing I wanted to mention to you is that it's really important to pay attention to grading rubrics. Um, I think this is going to take me to this. Um, no, it is not. Okay. Um, yeah, here is this and um, new share. I think you see Canvas right now. Can somebody just say yes, we see it or no, we don't? Yeah, we see it. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Anna. Um, so here. No, you cannot see the rubrics. Okay, then let me show you where to find rubrics. So if you want to know how I'm going to grade those discussion boards, here's the discussion board. Let's click this one. And most of the time for almost all assignments, you'll see the rubric down here. But for this, for discussion boards, you have to go up here and then you have to click show rubric and you'll see how I'm grading it. So your initial post 250 to 350 words, specific ideas in two or more paragraphs. You're going to find out I love paragraphs. It paragraphs are for an audience. They help that audience follow. And it also includes a relevant image. And um, so for your initial post to get the full 10 points, you have to have all of that. Um, your peer responses, um, it's gonna establish a connection to the original post and extend the conversation in approximately 100 words. So you're not just repeating it, you're not just saying, hey, that was awesome, I love that you got to do that. No, you are really, adding to something. Um, for example, you might post on, um, oh, I, I forget, one of my students, it might be in this class, Derek, was it you? I think so, um, was in a robotics team. And um, so you might ask, whoa, robotics, that's so cool. Are you working with AI? Are you like, what kinds of robots did you, I mean, like those, that's extending a discussion and Derek, if that were Derek. Um, Derek, was it you? Yeah, it was me. I um, worked on the robotics club at my high school, so yeah. yeah. Um, robotics is so cool. Not that I have any scientific knowledge of that at all, but um, so it would be asking those questions of Derek and one of Derek's responses could actually be at least 100 words, response, extending that, answering the question. And so you'll see how I'm grading and I think that that's really useful. Questions about the discussion board? Okay, then let's stop that share and go back. Um, somebody asked a question in the chat. Yes, thanks, Carlos. Um, so let me go back to um, to the PowerPoint. Yeah, those grading rubrics. Um, I try and be as transparent as I possibly can, um, but sometimes I am communicating in a way that I think makes sense. 
but until a student actually says, yeah, no, I don't know what you're asking, then I don't actually know. So I'm gonna put you in grading rubrics, of, in grading rubrics. Ah, I do have language, I do have words. Um, I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms. Um, short introductions, I want you to introduce yourself and where you're from. Um, you know, like I'm from Boston or I'm from San Diego. I live in Mira Mesa or I live in La Mesa. Um, and I want you very quickly to find one thing that you all have in common. And then I want you to use this image so this image right here that you've seen on Canvas already, I found it on Google Images and I use this image to represent analysis. And actually that's what I named it. I have um, files with Google Images that I use over and over again. And I actually named this one analysis. And I want you to talk as a group and i want you to analyze break down this image to try and develop why i would use this as analysis so you have everything you're supposed to do introduce yourselves where you are from one thing you have all in common and then analyze the image wow that a lot of that's a lot of analyze. Analyze the image and figure out why this says analysis to me. So um, let me um, do this. Let me stop share. And um, I need to give you some information. Um, uh, let's see, Dallas. So this, I'm going to put that image into our chat. And so if you want, you can pull that up and one of you can screen share so that all of you can look at that image. Um, it's overloaded brain, but that doesn't matter. It says analysis to me, whatever they used it for. Okay, um, I'll enable, oh, Michaela has just gotten here and I'm going to label it so you guys can share screen and one of you will be able to share that image if you pull it up. So breakout rooms, um, I'm going to do Um, eight breakout rooms. So you'll have groups of three to four per room. Okay. Um, you'll have about four minutes because that's a lot to cover. Okay. There you go. You'll get an invitation. Just say yes and then you'll get a warning. Hey Google, set timer for three minutes. Hi, you're back. It's kind of nice when there are only 15 people in the room. Um, I guess there's 20 of us because I can actually see your faces. With 30, you all don't fit on the same page, which is sad, um, but it's okay. Welcome back. So I'm going to call on groups. Um, group one, what did you have in common? Anybody from group one? Uh, we were all from California. Nice. That was, that, that, did that take very long, Kyle? 
no it didn't we all just introduced <laughs> ourselves and where we're from and then we were like yeah we're, we're all from california excellent group two what do you have in common uh we're all from different places but we're all still i believe in california now at this point so okay. yeah actually that's that's pretty interesting because i know not everybody who is from someplace else came to California. Um, I know I have students who are meeting in other states. Um, last spring, I had students in other countries because they went back home wherever they were from. Uh, group three, what did you have in common? Um, we got a little bit further than California because we're all from the US. <laughs> That's our thing in common. We're just gonna expand. Why not? Um, yeah, group four. Uh, we're all from California. Okay, that seems to be a theme. Group five. <laughs> we're proud to announce that we are also all from California. Okay, I need harder questions. Group six. Um, we all have sisters. Oh, that's, see, that's <laughs> different. Nice, Andy. Uh, group seven. Uh, we're all from San Diego. Okay, also a little different. Now we're pulling back in. Um, group eight. Um, all I really found was that we all have multiple Wednesday classes. <laughs> well, and that could be a little stressful. So, um, okay. yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share the screen again. I'm going to go back to that image. And um, let me go down to just speaker view and move myself out of the way um, so that we can look at the image. So I asked you to analyze this image and tell me, kind of break it down and give me reasons why this says analysis to me. So I'm gonna start with group eight. Anyone from group eight, what did you come up with? Well, uh, someone in our group pointed out that different symbols within the, the, the cloud above the, the, the mind is um, kind of represents different aspects of analysis. He pointed out that the green arrow kind of represents information being put in and that uh, white squiggly line kind of looks like he's questioning and and that the two different faces represent multiple perspectives. Good, good. Um, group seven. Um, tell me, oh, actually, David, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So, so you pointed out the green arrow that information coming in. Why is information coming in important to the analytical process? Well, you need something to analyze, I would say. Okay, good, good. Um, group seven, what can you add? Something else that you saw that um, that David didn't see, or you want to add to something he talked about um, to sort of expand that discussion? Well, we were kind of saying, at least I was thinking for analysis, how like the, I think they're called like the cogs kind of look like a machine, how like the information is getting inputted and it's like works through and then you get an output kind of. Um, yeah. Analysis is a process and you have to go through that process in order to come up with anything. Yeah. Um, group six, what can you add? Uh, I said that um, there are two eyes and two mouths. And so analysis is just as much about what you observe as what you say about what you observe. I Okay, so this is the third time I've done this little exercise and nobody's ever said that. But yeah, it's observations, it's what you speak. Um, 
Yeah, I like that. Um, group, am I on group five? Group five, what can you add? Um, we just felt like because the picture shows a bunch of different gears inside of the person's head and a bunch of different things going on that basically when you're analyzing something you can come at it from a lot of different angles and there's a lot of different parts of your brain working together to come to a conclusion and then um, we also were noticing that there are two people in it and that minds can work together to analyze something and that people can work together to form a bigger picture. I think that that's a really powerful observation um, that we find more things out as we collaborate. Um, honestly, you all are bringing up ideas that I've never thought of. And so that, that importance of different perspectives and collaboration is super, super valuable. Group four. Anybody? Wait, okay. So what our group just thought of um, was basically the same thing with the gears. So like in a machine, any little gear um, is important to the outcome of the analysis. So um, like a machine, the small gear can make like a, like a sudden big impact. And so like, like in a piece of literature, this one specific excerpt can have like a profound impact on the meaning of the entire text. Yeah, I would say, um, by the way, this is Diego. I don't know if you met him last time. He has decided my lap is fair game if I'm sitting on a chair and not typing. So um, yeah, I, can, I would say sometimes a single word or a single image or a phrase can drastically shift the meaning of something. And so analysis does focus on, you know, like not just big picture things, global issues, but often very small elements that change what we're doing. Group three. Um, we also mentioned like the gears um, and then the thing I saw was how the information would go in with the arrow turning right and then it would go up and then it comes down so it feels like there's a whole process of analysis going on. Yeah, good Drea. Um, group two. I know it's coming, it's getting harder to come up with stuff but group two. Uh, our group thought about how kind of the location of all the symbols is up at the top of the head, kind of like their mind. And that um, there, since there's so much things going on, there's a lot of attention to detail and it's kind of overflowing over the edge. Yeah, um, I have students that go, how much analysis do you want, Aaron? And I go, a lot more. There's always more. And of course, you know, like at some point you have to stop. But group one, what can you add? Um, we, I think, well, we kind of had a lot of the same, but we also said that how there's just kind of like a lot going on, like with the cogs and the um, arrows and the mind, that kind of things can be like overwhelming when you're analyzing certain things. Yeah, and I think that that's I think that that's a really important idea, Reese. That um, it can be overwhelming when you're analyzing things, when you're taking in so much data and trying to figure it out, and the analytical process can be confusing, frustrating, um, all of that. Uh, one 
last thing that I wanted to add is this idea of input is if even if we are analyzing you know like a text or an image our previous experiences and our previous knowledge are things that we use to analyze the new thing and so we are constantly synthesizing what we see and we're analyzing it based on what we already know which i think is important to remember um sometimes you might learn something and you go i'm never going to need that but that thing that you're learning it's helping to inform the way you see everything else now I want to kind of shift gears and I want to talk about writing because this is it's a writing class for one thing and it's a writing class where we're thinking about writing and thinking about um, we're thinking about writing and we're thinking about how we learn to write and we're thinking about how identity and language intersect and how that would inform how we learn and what we write and so i'm going to put you in the same groups again and i want you to come up with two things i want you to come up with things that people assume or think about writing or i could even add think about how to learn to write you know like what do we assume about writing and i want to add this last piece because people are not homogeneous i mean we all have different experiences um different backgrounds um different educational experiences different experiences with writing and so our assumptions might be different and so when i when you come up with these assumptions, I also want you to think about who might have those assumptions. So you might say, first year students probably think X, or teachers probably think this, or you, you get the idea? Okay, so I hope you have a made note of this, and let me, um, get out of the screen share and put you in your groups again. Same groups this time. Um, you'll get about three minutes this time to come up with something and then I'll ask you to share again. Okay, so we're all back. Um, I, what kind of assumptions do people make about writing and which people? I wanna start with group five this time. Anybody from group five? Sorry, Ma, off to say group five. Okay, Matthew, um, what kinds of assumptions uh, I would honestly, I don't really write, like writing all that much. And I always assume that, oh, I see an assignment, like, and I, I don't want to do it. Like it's writing. I get pretty bad writer's block sometimes, but I think for me, writing always depends on the material. So what I'm writing about, because I definitely have difficulty writing about certain topics, but 
sometimes I'll sit down and start writing and it kind of just flows. So I think I always assume that writing is going to be either enjoyable or not enjoyable based on the material. So I hear a lot of assumptions in there. The assumptions are beliefs. Um, writing is hard. School writing is often boring because you're not interested in it. And if you got to write what you were interested in, it would be better. Is that pretty much Matthew? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, and who would have those assumptions? Um, I think probably students. Um, group four, um, any assumptions about writing or how you learn to write? Beliefs? Group four? Anybody can speak up for group four? Um, I think a lot of students like believe that there's like only one like correct way to write which like makes it more difficult like a lot of students like don't know that like there's multiple styles to writing so like if they learn like those different styles it could be easier for them. That is a really profound belief Michaela um, that a lot of people have especially students but I encounter it in um, with friends that they assume there's one way to write and honestly the way we write in school is not the way people write once they leave university yeah really good um group six any other assumptions that you came up with um so we kind of thought that people like when you first start out in high school and you're first taking you're taking your first English class you kind of get grouped into like you're either really good at writing or you're really bad at writing so I feel like people assume that they can't get better that like writing like you can't get better um, if you're really bad at it or people who are really good also assume that there's nothing to improve so they don't try to get better um, when in reality writing is just like anything else where if you practice and you like take time to like brush up on your vocabulary and stuff, then it'll improve. A really great point, Andy. Um, and I want to combine that with what Michaela said, is sometimes students are really good at one type of writing, but they assume that, that they don't think that kind of writing counts. And so learning that practice in one type of writing that they're good on can feed the confidence. Um, also, this is, a, you, you pointed out that sometimes students assume they're really good at writing and so they have nothing more to learn and students think they're really bad at writing and, and they can never be good. And that's why in the syllabus I pointed out that no matter where you are with your writing right now, I want you to see yourself as a novice in university writing, you know, like that you are starting from a space that, not that you don't have a level of expertise, all of you, um, but there's more to learn and that I'm your coach and that together we support, we support each other and encourage one another and challenge one another to grow in our writing. Um, we can learn a lot from each other. Back to that idea of analysis, the collaboration. You know, like as we analyze together, we'll see things that individually we might not have seen. Um, we only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to cut this part short. And I want to go back to our PowerPoint. Um, and, and I want to switch gears and I, I want to talk, this is a rhetoric class. And um, In the past, I'm assuming that you've taken English classes and not rhetoric classes. And so it's important to know what rhetoric is because all of the writing that we're gonna do is going to be through this lens, through this um, direction of rhetoric. Um, maybe three or four of you, what do you know about rhetoric already? Um, 
you know, like just unmute yourself and speak. I would say that rhetoric is, um, I guess, the art of speaking and writing effectively. Yeah, good. Thanks, Hannah. What can you add to that? What else? Somebody else. What do you know about writing or rhetoric? Rhetoric, I think it like specifically means writing with the purpose behind it. So like the author writing it has a point they want to get across and then they write to explain that point. Um, yeah, that idea of a purpose is really, really valuable. So it's effective writing and speaking that has a purpose. What else can we add to this definition? Anybody? Um. Um, I read a book that said that rhetoric is the art of persuasion. So you use like a lot of different um, tools in your writing to kind of persuade your reader like to understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, um, good, Roxanne. Let's, um, in fact, here it is, the definition. Um, Aristotle, ancient guy from Athens, long gone, I think it's like 323. Uh, before the common era. Um, it's the ability to determine the available means of persuasion. For example, you have a purpose and you want to communicate that purpose to somebody else in a way that makes them think, oh yeah, I'm totally going to do that. Or, whoa, I never thought of that before. Or, this is really, this is really important. Or, this doesn't matter. Or, this is good. Or, this is bad. Or, it's, it's to change their way of thinking in some way, or sometimes it's sort of a rah-rah um, to make them think it more, or so, so it isn't just to do something, but it's to shape the way somebody thinks. Richard Weaver, who is, a more, not, is more modern, he says, thinking this available means of persuasion, the various strategies you can use, individual word and phrase choices, the way you construct your sentences, images that you add. He says rhetoric moves the soul with a movement that cannot finally be justified logically. Sometimes you're moved to tears and you can't, you can't say why specifically or anger, or you just want to do something, change something, and you can't say why, what it was, but rhetoric moves the soul. He says, all things considered, rhetoric, noble or base, is a great power in the world. He said, at its truest, it seeks to perfect men, and I would say people, by showing them better versions of themselves. It also works the reverse way. Um, a characteristic concern of rhetoric is the manipulation of people's beliefs for political ends, to form attitudes or induce actions in other human agents. And so rhetoric can be used for good, to help people be their best selves, and it can be used to make people angry, fearful, to make people want to hurt somebody else. And, and I think that it's important that, yes, this effective means of persuasion, I'm going to skip those slides, those effective means of persuasion can be used for noble purposes or negative purposes. It just depends. I want to go back to this idea of assumptions because there are, <clears throat> we all have what we might call underlying assumptions, pre existing beliefs that influence the way we see the world. Um, as we were sharing assumptions about writing, some of you, they resonated with some of you. Some of you, um, when I, th I think it was Matthew said, um, 
I think it might be boring to have to write something or it might be interesting. Or when Andy shared, I'm a good writer, I have nothing else to learn, I've always gotten A's in writing, or that resonated with you, or the assumption that I'm a terrible writer and I'm not good at it, and I'm probably not gonna be good in this class. So, or that there's only, um, as Michaela said, there's only one way to write. And so, these pre-existing beliefs influence the way you might approach this class. Um, pre-existing beliefs can make a difference with any argument. And you probably notice that my syllabus and the way I've structured this class have very much been keeping awareness of these underlying assumptions that students might have. Um, when I teach an upper division writing class, I know that students have different assum assumptions about writing. And I am aware, I try to be aware of the beliefs my students have about writing so I can appeal to those, acknowledging that those exist. Writers write for specific audiences. Very rarely do they write for a general, all-person audience because they are aware that individual audiences have worldviews. Um, they have givens, ideas or facts they take for granted, things they believe to be true, beliefs, things that are accepted, um, values. And um, writers, speakers want to be aware of their individual audiences so they can speak to those things to make their ideas more acceptable, more willing to be accepted. And so we're gonna be thinking about that um, in particularly this weekend. So we're, you're wrapping up your assignments for this week and there is a reading that I would like you to take a look at um, for Monday so that we can discuss it on Monday. And it's on the very last page of this week's module. It's by Ben Rafeth, who is a Writing Center director. And the article is titled, Why Visit Your Campus Writing Center? And so as you read, you don't have to write anything, but I want you to think about these things. Who is Rafeth's audience? And what does he assume that they, that audience, believes about writing or about writing centers? Also, I want you to think, how does he build his identity, his persona, in the article? How does he build his ethos? And ethos, um, sometimes people think it's an ethical argument, but it's ethical because we trust somebody who is ethical. So how does Rafa show that he's trustworthy? What are some things, specific things he does to get his audience to trust him? And then what claims or assertions does he make about writing centers? And how does he support those claims? Now, um, all of those questions are on Canvas. I'm switching away from that, and I will, in the future, always post the PowerPoint so you can take notes on that. Um, but those are the questions that I want you to think about, and we'll start asking those questions on Monday morning when we meet together in class. Any final questions for me? Okay, it was really great to see you. We're gonna wrap up, it's 11.49, and you have other Wednesday classes to go to or things you have to do. So. Um, I have a question really fast. Yes, Sorry. Joe. Uh, my my like Wi-Fi like shut down, so I missed a couple slides. So is there like a way I can look at that like after this? I will post the video a little bit later for those of you who want to look at it again, and I'll have the PowerPoint up okay. also. Okay? okay.
Thank you so much. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day, great weekend, and I'm happy to answer any emails or questions that you have. Sorry, um, really quick question. Um, Andy. The 10 ways to think about writing, mm -hmm. did you want us to, as we read it, did you want us to like take notes or, or we will, will we be discussing it in class sometime or? We will discuss it in class specifically, but there is a journal that you'll write. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Then that's it. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Too. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Great job, Thank all you. of you.